Well, how about if I get started? Uh, maybe there'll be others joining us, but why don't we go ahead and get started? So, welcome everybody. Um, I am Scott Granite. I am, as you can see on the slide here, uh, I'm not British. Um, I am from Redwood City, California, uh, which is about 30 or 40 kilometers from south of San Francisco, if any of you have been to San Francisco. All right, um, so just to tell you a little bit about um, my talk today. I'm going to be talking about, as the title says, living with BDD across the lifespan. Um, now, I should stay up front that I have BDD myself. I'm a therapist, but I have, and I specialize in BDD, uh, but I've lived with, lived with it myself for a very long time. And actually, this year marks my 50th year of living with BDD. So, right, pretty remarkable. I know there are others around who have lived around, lived that long with BDD, although you very rarely hear much about people as they get older with BDD, uh, which is the main reason why I wanted to do uh, this talk today. All right, so, and we're such a small group, if anybody has any questions, comments you want to make along the way, please feel free to do so. I'm always happy to answer questions. All right, so start with a little bit about my own journey of living with BDD. So here I am. I'm on the left, by the way. Um, I think in this picture, I am 10 years old. And this was before I developed any symptoms of BDD. So the reason I'm showing this is I do think that at this age, I was actually too concerned about my hair. I didn't really have BDD at that point, but I'm gonna tell you a story about it, which I think helps to set the stage of what I went through when I was younger. So I remember being in my neighborhood and a couple of friends and I were hanging out in the street and we were all about 10 years old and this girl came up to us, one of our neighbors, who and she was maybe all of 14. And she, she came up to us and she said, I can tell which one of you is gonna go bald. And so she had us put our head down she looked at all the kids. She got to me and she said, you're gonna be bald. That was 59 years ago. So I went running home. None of my other friends did this, but I went running home and my grandmother was there at the time. And I remember to this day going like this to her. He said, see, see, look what's happening here. See, I was 10 years old. Uh, I don't remember what she said, uh, but it was something like, what are you talking about? You're 10 years old. And I realized only years later that that may have helped to set the stage uh, for this, that I was already somehow more concerned about my hair than anybody else was. Now, I should add that prior to this picture, when I was as young as two or three, my hair was very curly and my mother always kept my hair fairly long and I received a lot of attention regarding my hair. And this is even pre-verbal, pretty much. People would come up to me, come up to my mother, and make comments about my hair. And I think that that also contributed to why this became such a powerful uh, force in my life and why I was the only kid who went running home uh, to ask about his hair. And the others who were also told they were going bald, they just went out to play. Um, and so it was, very, it was very different for me. But the, so a couple of things I want to mention about my childhood, uh, which is very relevant um, in my development of BDD, is I was se se severely bullied when I was younger, from, probably from the age of, it's hard for me to remember, but probably from the age of five to 15 uh, by one of my siblings. Uh, my father wasn't around very much. He was a very successful businessman, but he traveled a lot. 
Um, and so he was very distant, and I have no memories. Actually, I don't have any memory of my father ever being home for dinner during the work week. Uh, he maintained an apartment in New York City, and that's where he stayed uh, mostly. So I really did not have a very close relationship with him. It got a little bit closer as he got older, but certainly not when I was growing up. Um, I moved, my family and I moved when I was 14, and that resulted in my losing all my friends. And that's a rough age to go through that. Um, and so I, um, I really didn't make any new friends after, after the move, um, and so I was very isolated at that point. It was a very difficult time in my life. My parents were not getting along. Uh, they ultimately divorced. And again, at this point, I had not yet uh, developed BDD. But again, I think this is all sort of setting the stage for why I think my, my BDD sort of developed uh, later. Okay. Chris, I'll apologize in advance. You've seen these slides. Um, so, the age of 18, this is one year uh, before my BDD really, decided, really developed. Um, let's see, that was my freshman year in college, and I looked very much like a lot of other people at that time. You know, we were all trying to emulate the Beatles at that point, uh, and, and I was no different. So, so at that point, it just felt like the BDD came on really suddenly for me. I remember taking a shower, washing my hair, and all of a sudden, I saw all these hairs in my hand. And I panicked. I thought, well, what's going on here? And I thought, all right, well, maybe this is just one day. Well, it kept on happening. And to me, I thought that was a sign right then and there that I was losing my hair. It didn't occur to me that maybe I was always losing that much hair in the shower. I, but I just never paid any attention to it. So also at that time in my life, there was again a lot of, a lot of stress. Uh, again, parents divorcing. Uh, at that point, there were a lot of financial problems at home. Uh, the college I went to uh, threatened to throw me out several times because the bills weren't getting paid. Uh, school was difficult. I managed, but it was difficult. And I was having, a, there was a lot of stress around dating. I found dating to be a very frustrating experience at that point. Um, and I think all of that sort of contributed to maybe the BDD starting at that, at that point. From that moment on, I did experience a lot of bouts of major depression. Um, never before that would I have considered myself to be depressed, but I certainly began experiencing a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety. Though, interestingly, at least interestingly to me, I functioned pretty well, actually. Um, I finished college, went off to graduate school, um, so, I did pretty well, but I always knew one thing. I knew that if I ever lost my hair, I'd have to kill myself. There was no question in my mind. It didn't occur to me, I mean, at that point, I had friends at, who were, you know, my age in college, who were already starting to lose their hair, but they never spoke like this. Uh, they never expressed such despair about it, and they were actually losing their hair. Uh, but, you know, I didn't think of this as a psychiatric problem. I just thought, well, you know, I'm young. Who wants to lose their hair that, at that age? Um, oh, well, let me get back to this. Um, so anyway, I began... This is when all my rituals started, and so one of the things that I decided at that age was I wasn't going to get any more haircuts. I hated the idea of somebody touching my hair, and it's hard to get a haircut if you don't let somebody touch your hair. So I, so I decided I would just do it myself. Um, you, saw, you saw a very quick glimpse of what I looked like after I took my hair into my own hands. Um, I'm smiling in that picture, but um, at the time I really didn't think I looked all that bad. <laughs> but it was my hair was curly, I would just sort of cut the bangs, 
And one of my compulsive behaviors is that I would shower, wash my hair, and then not touch it. Uh, I wouldn't comb it. Uh, what happens when you comb your hair? Well, you see hair in the comb. So I decided I wasn't going to do that. Um, but somehow, I, re I did remain pretty functional. I like, I like showing this picture. This was my last year in college. Uh, what I like to point out in this picture is that that's a tree behind me. So not all of it is my hair. Um, a lot of it's my hair, but not all of it. And that's the way things went uh, for me. I just sort of continued to grow my hair long. Fortunately, it was a time of, you know, a time when people were doing that. Um, so again, at the age of 19, the idea of losing my hair just seemed completely unacceptable. Um, I was really concerned about dating, uh, thinking that it just wasn't going to happen for me. And at that age, I was especially concerned about my peers. You know, what were other people going to say? And especially with dating, it just seemed to me it was kind of an impossible task to begin with. And if I didn't have my hair, then, then what? Now, also, there was a lot of shame that I was experiencing. Now, one of the things I do, we'll talk about a little bit later, is that, is this a chicken or egg thing? Did the BDD cause my shame? Or did I already have shame, and that contributed to the BDD? I happen to think it's the, it's the latter. Um, and so I know I'm going to talk about some things today that are a little bit different than what we've, what we've been hearing so far uh, throughout the conference, in that I do think we need to understand why somebody gets BDD, uh, beyond just so whatever neurochemical or functions of the brain uh, contribute to it. Uh, I do think there's a reason why most people get PD, and that reason is different for everybody, for sure. Uh, but that's why I'm talking about it, that I think for, we know that with BDD, it tends to be a shame-based disorder. And I think understanding that piece of it, that the shame in all likelihood came first, I think is, a, is very important in treatment. As I said, I was at this age having uh, my first thoughts of suicide. I. Um, Fortunately, never have made a suicide attempt. I began saying this thing to myself that to this day, I don't really understand what it means. It meant something to me, but I used to say to myself, I'm staying alive out of protest. Um, of course, I knew that I couldn't kill myself. I mean, I have a very close family. Um, I knew it would be very hurtful for them. Um, but it just felt unfair to me to have to stay alive, and so I just sort of came up with this saying that I'm staying alive for other people, but not for myself. Uh, a lot of compulsive behaviors. Uh, as I said, I stopped combing my hair. I was always asking for reassurance, especially with uh, my mother. Um, my mother used to say to me, I would go to her, I would sort of part my hair and have her look at my scalp. And she would say to me, you have more hair than Carter has liver pills. Does that mean anything to anybody? No, apparently it was a thing in the 40s and 50s where this company, Carter, made these pills. Uh, for liver, I have no idea what it was. Anyway, it's pretty popular. Do people know who Yul Brenner is, was? So as much as my mother was, so for those of you who don't know, Yul Brenner was an actor in the, what, 50s, 60s, 70s probably? Um, uh, what was his big role? The King and I, I think he was in. So my mother, as wonderful as she was, she was the best support I ever had. I'd go like this, you know, have her look at my hair, and she would say to me, what are you worried about? Yul, Yul Brenner looks great. <laughs> that wasn't, he was bald. He had no hair. He shaved his head. That wasn't particularly reassuring to me, but she tried her best. Uh, there was a lot of mirror checking. As we know, with so many people with BDD, um, I basically had a favorite mirror, and I, the lighting had to be just right. Um, I would also take my, um, you know, different couple of mirrors so I could look at the back. I had a lot of behaviors with the mirror. Uh, sometimes I would count the hairs that came out in the brush. Um, I had in my mind a certain number of hair that seemed acceptable to me to lose. And anything beyond that just really freaked me out. 
and it was a very low number, so I was freaked out, you know, quite a lot of the time. And these behaviors just continued, although, I, as I mentioned, I did function pretty well, but, you know, I was spending, you know, at least an hour a day with, with, these, with these behaviors. Now, also at that time, BGD was not a recognized diagnosis. Uh, we, you know, was the DSM-5 was talked about earlier today. It wasn't in the DSM at this point, of, at this point in my life. So again, I didn't think I had a psychiatric problem. And in fact, there was no psychiatric problem with this name at that point. But I also didn't understand why I was so distressed. Uh, I was the only one feeling this way. Um, and I, so as a result, I felt very alone with this problem. I could talk about it with my family, and you know they've been very supportive. But I felt so ashamed in mentioning to anybody else. You know, how could I mention it to my friends? You know, my college, my college friends. Uh, at this point, maybe some coworkers. So I felt very, very alone with it. Um, I got to a point, though, between at the age of 19 and 30, where uh, you know I. I was doing all these compulsive behaviors, but I wasn't really getting depressed. I was, again, I was managing, I was managing pretty well. But I will say that I think all of this impeded my social development in some way. Um, I think it interfered with my dating, especially, because I had this feeling that as long as my hair was okay, not much else in life seemed to bother me, which is a problem, of course. Uh, because other things in life should be important. Uh, so I think it did sort of impede my, uh, my social functioning, at least for that, for that period of time. So as I got older, um, my first real bad bout with this was at the age of 30. Um, I was living uh, in San Francisco then. Uh, I should mention that I grew up in New Jersey and moved to San the San Francisco Bay Area right after graduate school. So this was a few years after I had moved. Um, it was the same, it was really the same thing, where I took a shower one day, and I, I looked in the mirror, that was always part of my ritual, I would get out of the shower, look at my hair, and feel like that if it looked okay, I could have a good day. If it looked bad, the rest of my day was, was awful. That's how I started every day. But fortunately, at that point, um, I get out of the shower and I look and I thought everything was okay. So, so things were good. Well, one day I got out of the shower, looked, and I saw some scalp. Previously, I wouldn't see any scalp. And I panicked again. I just didn't, I mean, I didn't know what it meant. Well, to me, what it meant was that was a sign that I was losing my hair. So that started several years of keeping the dermatologists in the San Francisco Bay Area in business. Uh, I, had, I went to at least 30 dermatology appointments. Um, they all said the same thing to me. Uh, they said, you got plenty of hair, you know, what are you worried about? Uh, one woman said to me, she said, you got, and I was 30-ish, and so she said, you have plenty of hair. Come back to me when you're 40. Well, instead of feeling great, but what did I think about? I thought to myself, what does she know about turning 40? You know, what's gonna to happen to me then? I even went to a hair growth clinic. Um, I mean, they, what they did is that they, they, they put me under a light. I've never been to Wembley Stadium, but if you think about Wembley Stadium being lit up, that's one of the lights they, they were shown right on my head. And they pointed to me and said, oh, look at all the, look at all the thinning you have. Nobody's hair could, could you know, could, um, would look well under that kind of lighting. And so they said to me, you know, for $1,000, this was back in the, I don't know what that would be in pounds, 1,500 maybe, but anyway. But this was back in the 80s. He said, for $1,000 or maybe more, we'll give you a full head of hair. Fortunately, I was smart enough that I didn't fall for it. Um, I'm sure some people did, but I didn't. Um, it was also a time in my life where I was, again, feeling very, very frustrated with my career at that point. 
I, was, I really wanted to be a, a therapist, but I was working in a nursing home, and it really wasn't what I was wanting to do. And I, I really, and I wasn't dating, um, and that was, big, that was a big frustration for me. Well, then I met my first wife, and remarkably, my BDD symptoms almost vanished. I was in love with her. Um, it just seemed like it went from being awful to almost not there. I mean, I still did a lot of my rituals, but I was no longer, I was no longer depressed. That marriage later ended in divorce. Um, and, and another very depressive um, episode. Um, there were problems. I mean, I can't say that my BDD was the source of the main problems we had, but my BDD certainly didn't help, and she didn't really understand it. She didn't know, you know what I was going through. And in fact, even at that point, there was still no name for this thing, so I didn't really under understand it either. And it did take a toll on my relationship. Was dip what was one of the main things that was different as I got older at this point was that I was in a relationship. Uh, and I needed to learn, to try and learn how to manage this problem because it wasn't just me anymore. Um, I was with somebody. And at that point, I did not do a very good job of managing it. It was just more than I, uh, than I, more, more than I knew how to deal with. Um, Chris, you've heard this story. But um, has anybody here been to San Francisco? Yeah, oh, several of you. Okay, good. So you know how beautiful it is. Twin Peaks, uh, San Francisco. Uh, very romantic spot on the top of some, on uh, top of the hills, where you can see um, this Golden Gate Bridge. The uh, San Francisco Bay is to the right, and beyond the Golden Gate Bridge is the Pacific Ocean, and right in front is the city. Beautiful spot. Um, so my girlfriend, my later be my wife, and I went to that spot. And I knew in as I was you know dating more, the question always came up to me: when do I tell somebody about this problem? I knew that I couldn't conceal it forever. I was doing a pretty good job with her of concealing it. Uh, you know, I always, you know. I would only groom in the bathroom. I never let her see me groom. And I don't think she saw anything or made anything of it. But I knew that this, this was a big thing in my life. And I knew that I, I had to share it. It was only fair uh, to share it. And I know this is a question that does come up for many patients, um, is you know, when do you share this problem? And so we went to Twin Peaks, very romantic spot. And I told her um, there was something I needed to tell her. And my wife had the most beautiful blue eyes. And she looked at me with those blue eyes, didn't say anything, and waited for me to say what would come next. So I said to her, there's something I have to tell you, and that is my hair is my, the most important part of my life. Um, and then, her reaction to that was priceless. What she said to me in response to that was, oh, thank God. I thought you were going to tell me you're gay. And you know, we both got a good laugh out of that. Uh, but we learned soon after that it wasn't very funny at all. Um, because soon after that, you know, as the relationship had some problems, then my BDD you know, then resurfaced. Uh, and by the time we got married, and then just a couple of years later, um, it really exploded. And that was part of what contributed to our divorce. I saw a lot of therapists then. Um, and I think you know, they were all pretty well-meaning. Um, but nobody knew what I was experiencing. Um, one therapist, after my coming into her, seeing her for, I don't know how long I was visiting her, but six months or so, I kept on talking about my hair every time. And she finally said to me, 
I can't help you with your hair. What else do you want to talk about? And I didn't blame her, really. I mean, I figured she didn't really understand, but that's kind of the kind of the reactions I got, is that people just didn't know what I was going through. I was given all sorts of medications, uh, medications that we know now don't really help uh, with BDD or OCD. And this was before uh, the development of the SSRIs. And so I was taking some of the tricyclic antidepressants, and it, it really didn't help for me at all. So I was finally, well, I diagnosed myself. Uh, I forget exactly when this was. It was probably late 80s, I think. Uh, do people know Catherine Phillips, who wrote The Broken Mirror? It's a book that everybody should have um, who has any interest in BDD. She wrote the first book. It's still probably considered the best book on, on BDD. Um, although I'm going to show you another good book, the one I wrote. Um, <laughs> but anyway. Um, so I was about 40 years old, 21 years, no, 22 years now um, after I first showed symptoms. I was a member, I became a member of this little known organization based in Connecticut called the Obsessive Compulsive Foundation. I joined them because, you know, people were diagnosed, you know, therapists and doctors told me I had panic disorder. I obviously had depression. Uh, somebody told me I had a phobia. Um, and I was reading about OCD, and I thought, well, this is pretty close, actually. I was having a lot of obsessive thinking, a lot of compulsive behaviors. Uh, I even started two OCD support groups in the area. And you know what they were talking about was, again, there was their obsessions and compulsions. But I was always the only one talking about a body part. Nobody else was talking about anything related to their body. So I get this newsletter from the Obsessive Compulsive Foundation, and the cover story is about people who are obsessing about their physical appearance, written by Catherine Phillips. And I was reading about all these behaviors and the thoughts and the thoughts of suicide. I couldn't believe it. She was talking about me. It was just remarkable. And this was before the days of the internet and, and email. And so I copied this article and sent it to members of my family across the country, and they all agreed. This is exactly what I was, what I was experiencing. Um, even my psychiatrist at the time um, didn't really know much about BDD, but I showed him this article, and, we, and he agreed. This is exactly what, what I had. Um, now, of course, all these years later, the, these, this tiny Obsessive Compulsive Foundation is now the International o OCD Foundation. Um, and several of us have worked very hard as part of their BDD special interest group in trying to increase awareness on BDD. So it's a, certainly our understanding of BDD is much greater now than it was back then. Uh, I started taking Zoloft. Um, at one point, I was up to 250 milligrams, which is beyond the, ther the typical therapeutic range. We know that with the serotonin drugs and OCD and BDD that people often take beyond the therapeutic range. So I think with Zoloft, you can go well beyond 250 even. But at 250, I had trouble sleeping, um, and so I had other side effects, so I had to bring it down to 200. But I stayed on Zoloft for 25 years. Um, and whenever I came off the medication, though, and there were times when I would come off of it, I would be doing well, figure, well, I don't need this anymore. Stop it, and about six months later, all hell would break loose again. Finally, my mother, who was very wise, I remember one time uh, telling her, I went off the medication, I feel great. And, you know, I still, I think, experienced some shame, even though I'm a therapist. I think I, I felt it as sort of a victory that I was able to come off medication. But she knew that in the past, when I've come off medication, I always fell apart at some point. The depression always, and the BDD always came back. And so she finally said to me, she said, and I told her how proud I was, and she said, there's no shame in taking medication. If you need it, you need it. And she was absolutely right. And so now, 
I'm taking uh, Lexapro, and I expect to be on Lexapro for the remainder of my life. I have, I have had enough experiences with this problem that I know that in, very, in all likelihood, if I come off it, I'll have another bad episode. So I don't want, I don't want that. So there are worse things in life than having to uh, take medication for this. Um, but again, I still had my episodes. I had a lot of bouts of depression still. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy did help quite a bit. And I was able to go through long periods uh, where the BDD, I wouldn't say it, went, it fully went into remission, but it might, it might have even gone to a point of it being subclinical. Um, so, as I got older, in middle age, um, I felt even more pressure. Uh, my, I had a daughter, I'll talk about her in a little bit. We were married, had a daughter. Uh, managing, managing a career was hard with this. Um, I remember once, many times, I was working in a psychiatric clinic. And I was just going through a very bad time. And on my way to the clinic every morning, I would stop at a fast food restaurant just to look at my hair, um, just to make sure everything was OK before I got to, before I got to work. At that point in my life, I felt even more shame. As I was getting older, you know, I thought to myself, is anyone really going to understand? Here I am in my 40s or in 50s. Are people really going to be that sympathetic when I complain about hair? Um, and so it even contributed even more to the shame. And frankly, you know, as we hit middle age, our bodies do change. And so, you know, whether it's skin, hair, height, I'm shorter now than I was a few years ago, um, it doesn't get better. Um, and so I think this is one of the additional challenges many people with BDD have because, you know, we know with BDD, you know, most people we know with BDD are probably diagnosed in their early teens. Or that's when they first begin to show symptoms. And we also know that as, you know, we, as was talked about earlier with the diagnosis, you know, whatever, quote, flaw is there is either non-existence or imperceivable to other people. Well, you know, as we get older, we do get, there are some changes. And these changes can be very, very difficult for, for people with this disorder. Um, so, I remarried. By the way, two marriages. Not like five or ten. I've had two. <laughs> um, our daughter was born two months premature. Um, she came home with she had some kind of a heart um, arrhythmia, and so she came home with a uh, heart monitor, um, and it was very very stressful because this, hot, this heart monitor went off like every ten minutes, um, and my wife became very ill with preeclampsia. And so it was an extraordinarily stressful time. Uh, I thought in the beginning I coped pretty well. Um, you know, I was there when my wife needed me I took care of the baby. And, but after about six months, it just exploded. As bad as my BDD was prior, I didn't think I could get to the depths that I experienced then. It was the only time that I was hospitalized. I got to a point, and again, I was working at a psychiatric clinic, and I remember calling my sister. I was in between patients, actually. And I called my sister and I said, I can't take it anymore. I don't know what to do. I'm either going to kill myself or go to the hospital. And she said, go to the hospital. And so I went to the receptionist, and I said, I'm not feeling well. I'm leaving. <laughs> and I took myself to the hospital. And what was especially difficult about this is that this is a hospital that many of our patients would go to. And I knew that there was some chance that I would run into my own patients. Fortunately, that didn't happen. And I was only there a couple of days. Um, nobody there had ever heard of BDD. Um, they were very kind to me. Um, and, but it was one of the better things I, I've ever done for myself even though they didn't really do anything for me. It was getting me out of that situation I was in with all the stress that I was experiencing. 
just to be away from it all. It seemed to, it seemed to help to reset something for me. Um, and I got my medication squared away too. Um, so um, I hated being in the hospital, but in hindsight, it was the best thing I did for myself at that time. And remarkably, for the next 13 years, I was fine. I was giving speeches all over the world on BDD. I gave a speech at, um, at, with OCD Action, I think in, Man in Manchester. Um, I gave a speech in Glasgow. Uh, I was traveling all over uh, giving speeches on BDD. And so I was doing really well for, for quite an extended period. And I was especially happy being a father. Uh, there was, to me, I mean, it just made life different. You know, everything before then was about me. Maybe my wife too, but about me. And as, and as soon as our daughter came, just life just changed. I suddenly had new responsibility and you know, people talk about a baby being a bundle of joy, and she certainly uh, has been. I do want to tell, tell one story about my daughter. Um, I'm sure you don't have the store Costco here, but what Costco is, is a big warehouse store. Um, oh, you do have Costco here? Well, what do you know? <laughs> I didn't know how about Canada. Is there a Costco in Canada? Yes, there's a Costco in Canada. Wow. All right, I stand corrected. I should have, I should have, looked, up, I should have looked it up before coming. So anyway, um, I went to get my hair cut. Not at Costco. I went, I went, to, get, I went to get my hair cut. And um, I don't know why I was watching my daughter that day. It must have been on the weekend. But I, I, she was with me. Typically, when I would get my hair cut, I had to go by myself. Because there's a whole ritual involved after getting a haircut where I want to go home, wash it, and sort of survey the damage. But I was watching her, and so she had to come with me. Um, and so I get my haircut. I don't think I've ever gotten a haircut I've liked. But so after the haircut, I, she's sitting down. I turned to her and I said, and she at the time was seven or eight. And I said, what do you think? She looked at me and she said, you look really goofy. And I did. I mean, the way they left my hair, they made me look like the fifth beetle. Um, I mean, I did, really didn't like what they had, what they had done. But I, I promised, so ordinarily, I would just race home, wash my hair, comb it, and see, see how it was. But this time, I had promised her we'd go to Costco, get some frozen yogurt and pizza. Um, I'm a big spender. Um, <laughs> and so, but I was thinking about my hair, um, so kind of distracted. But we get to Costco, we're having a frozen yogurt. My daughter's having a great time. You know, she's, she's laughing, I'm laughing. And it hit me in that moment. She could care less how I looked. I was her father, and she loved me. Got me. It was so impactful for me. I mean, I know my family loves me, but there was something about this moment that it was, I recognized that who I was to her as a person, that's what was important. It had nothing to do with my hair. It was such a profound experience to me. Plus, I was having a good time. Um, you know, I was being distracted, and I wasn't really thinking much about, about how I looked. And so the idea that somebody could love me that had nothing to do with how I looked was a foreign concept to me. Um, I just never thought of it that way. As you can see to this day when I talk about it, it gets me emotional. So prior to this talk, I um, looked up the definition of old age and elderly. You know what it says? 65 and older. All right. So I'm elderly. <laughs> um, so in preparing for this talk, really one of the main reasons I wanted to give this talk 
was to talk about BDD as somebody older now. Because there's nothing out there. You know, any TV show, any interview you see on TV, or any article that's written about BDD, is never about somebody my age. It's always a teenager, a young adult. We hear nothing about people as they get older. Um, and so when I did an internet search, that's what I found. Nothing. Uh, there were some articles about body image and aging, but body image is different than BDD. Uh, you know, a lot of people struggle with body image, but don't really meet the criteria for a diagnosis of, of BDD. Um, and I thought to myself, well, I have BDD. I mean, I, yes, I still have BDD. Um, it doesn't cause the same um, difficulties it once did, but it's not as if it's gone away. I mean, it's still there. Um, so I had done very well for 13 years. The pandemic hit. And in the beginning, I thought I was fine. I was worried about my practice. I'm in private practice. And I remember telling somebody, all right, if I lose half of my clients, I'll be OK. Because um, I was worried that, I mean, this was you know, Zoom. We were just starting with Zoom. I couldn't really figure it out. And people, people couldn't come into my office. I thought my career was probably as over. Um, now, little did I know that maybe like three weeks later, I was suddenly busier than I ever had been. Um, so whatever worries I had about my career tanking, it couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, but still, there was a lot of stress. Um, I think the whole, f you know, during the pandemic, this whole feeling of being out of control in some way, I think triggered something inside of me. Uh, that's when I switched medication to Lexapro at that point. Uh, probably the big breakthrough for me was Instead of beginning, instead of going back to cognitive behavioral therapy, I decided to see a trauma therapist. My wife said to me, you know, you've done all this other therapy before. Why don't you try and get to the roots of the BDD? Why don't you try to understand it more? Um, and she was right. And so I found a therapist who I don't think, before seeing me, knew anything about BDD. Um, but she's very good with trauma. So I had never really dealt with my own trauma of being severely bullied and being neglected. Um, and part of what I learned is that this sort of relates a little bit to, what was his name, Dr. Gilbert, or Professor Gilbert we heard this morning, a little bit of what he was talking about. Um, which is I've come to learn that my BDD seems to serve some safety function. Um, it's an awful, awful disorder to have. But anybody with BDD will tell you that if you have a day that you look good, or you look better, you're on top of the world. You suddenly feel more confident. And my therapist, and then so, but the, what are the therapists, what, what the therapist took me with this is she, she began saying to me, well, those times where you're not feeling confident, what's that about? And what's going, what's going on? Why aren't you feeling confident? Um, I also would have, with my BDD, a lot of bouts of anger. And that's something, too, we don't hear a lot about with BDD. But I do come across a lot of people who get very angry over this. Um, I can remember once when I was a, um, for a few years, several years before this, uh, I was feeling very frustrated with my hair. And it was an old family chair uh, that I had since a kid. And I took that chair. I was so angry. I broke it into little pieces. I was really upset with myself. This chair had been in the family for a very long time. I tried to glue it back together. But it was in so many pieces, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and so my therapist began asking, she said to me, you know, what are you angry about? And I said, my hair, of course. 
And then she said, what are you really angry about? And that really moved the therapy in a different place in trying to understand, you know, where was this coming from? You know, where were all these feelings coming from? And understanding the shame that I was experiencing. So I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about this a little later. What was different at this time in my life with this really bad episode, I mean, I said earlier, I think when I was, when my, after my daughter was born, that I didn't think my BD could get any worse at that point when I was hospitalized. I never thought it could get as bad as it was then. How I survived with the depression, with the not sleeping, um, the many thoughts of suicide, I don't know how, it, I mean, somehow I got through it. Uh, but it was awful. It was just awful. All my other episodes would go on for maybe a few months at most and I would feel better. This one went on for like two years. Um, the reason I put my daughter here on this part of the story is she was now an adult. She was just graduating college. She had never before then seen the BDD in action. She, she knew I had BDD, she knew I was giving speeches, she knew I was on TV. Uh, and I, I, would teach in, I would teach on BDD at, at a lot of universities, but she had never seen it in action. And I got really depressed. And here was, you know, I just, I know that she, my daughter looks up to me, I've always been very strong in, in her eyes, and at this point, I was like a ball of jelly, or jello. Um, and I remember this, oh, I was so, so hurtful. Um, my wife, my daughter, and I were in the car, and they needed to do some food shopping, so I stayed in the car. And I saw the two of them walking together, and my daughter collapsed in my wife's arms. And I thought I knew what was happening, but I later asked my wife, I said, what happened there? And she said, Allison, is so upset about what's happening to you. She doesn't know what to. She doesn't know what to make of it. I wish, at that moment, I could just say to myself, "The hell with BDD. It's never this important. I'm just gonna. This is gonna stop." But it just got the better of me. I couldn't. I couldn't control it. Um, and so, that was one of the most difficult things at that age for me, was watching the impact that it now had on my my daughter. Well, um, fast forward to today. My symptoms are much better controlled. Um, but as you get older, I again sort of had the same thoughts in middle age, which was like at the age of 65 and I'm, on, and I'm complaining about my hair, who's going to want to hear it? I mean, it's one thing if you're that age and you're, I mean, if you're worried about hair or skin or your nose and you're like 20 or 30, but at 65, who's gonna take, who's gonna, who's gonna take me seriously? I mean, there, as much shame as I was experiencing early on, there was even more shame at this age. Um, I was worried about my career, like I said. I had thoughts about, should I just retire? Uh, would I lose everything I had worked so hard for? Uh, and again, you know, physical change uh, with age. Um, and so, and you know, I know as we get older, we do have less hair. And even though, you know, I recognize from my age, I still have a pretty good head of hair, uh, but I still see changes. Uh, and so that doesn't make living with BDD any, any easier. Um, and you know, one of the things I thought to myself is that shouldn't this all just get easier as I get older? I mean, appearance isn't supposed to mean this much. Well, there's no indication as people get older that BDD suddenly gets better. It's probably not going to get better without treatment. Just because you've aged doesn't mean you're going to get better with it. I've learned, and to me this is the biggest takeaway from this talk, 
My BDD, and this is true for anybody, BDD is never about how somebody actually looks. Never. If you think about the diagnosis, pay attention to the diagnosis, it clearly states we all look fine. And so we have to understand then what else is going on. You know, if you look fine and you're obsessing about your physical appearance, why? And I think it's, it's the why to that is a very important question. And so as we get older, you know, it's not as if life stressors and unresolved psychological issues suddenly stop. They continue to be important. And I look at BDD somewhat, I think, along the lines of what maybe Dr. Gillard was talking about which is that I do see it again as serving sort of a dissociative function, meaning that if you're paying attention so much to your body, a lot of other things in life don't seem to matter as much. Again, anybody with BDD who's going through a pretty bad episode with it, they would have the same answer that I would, which is that nothing else in life seems as important as the BDD. And it's kind of an odd way to think of your body when you, when you think about it. And so, again, I think you have to ask, you know, what else is this about? Um, I often say to my clients that body parts, our body parts, are not supposed to be important in this way. They're just not. The way people with BDD think about their body is just, it's just unusual. It's not the way it is for most people. It is, I think, a very complicated problem. Um, I know living with OCD is no picnic either, um, but I think BDD is far more complicated uh, in, in some ways. And it's not just you know, trying to lessen the obsessive thinking and the compulsive behaviors. Yes, that stuff is really important. But what's even more important is reclaiming your life and be, being able to live the kind of life that's consistent with your own values. Most people I know who have BDD, when it's active, are really not very happy with their lives in general. And what I often say to my clients is that let's talk about fixing those other areas of your life. What about developing healthy relationships? What about getting a job that you like? Uh, what about having more friends, um, taking up some hobbies? Because I happen to think, especially in meeting other people, when you make that connection uh, with other people, I do think that, that as long as it's a healthy connection, it's, it's an effective way of trying to weaken the importance of the BDD. For me, my BDD was like this companion uh, that was always with me. Uh, but, you know, my hair is really not meant to be a companion. Um, and I have noticed that as I'm involved in healthier relationships, again, where I feel supported, cared for, loved, there's less of a need for the BDD to be causing, uh, be causing problems. Um, now, we all know that you know, therapy is very hard work, but it clearly is, it clearly is worth it. Um, and I guess, oh, now, I recognize, you know, as I've spoken today about my experience with BDD, that parts of my story, like anybody with BDD, are pretty depressing. Um, now, I've noticed that maybe because of the title of this talk, there's nobody particularly young here. <laughs> um, but um, where was I going with that? Um, and I recognize, when I say that I'm one of the lucky ones, is that I've survived. We all know, well, most of us know, of people who have lost their lives to this. Um, it's, all too, it's all too common. I think, Chris, in your talk, you talked about you know, being about 25% of people with BDD make suicide attempts. That's an incredible number. It's as high as, I think, any disorder, uh, any psychiatric disorder. Um, but for me, you know, even though I have struggled, and I've struggled mightily at times, uh, my supportive, I have a wonderfully supportive family. They never, ever have treated me as mentally ill. They expected me to 
to have a good, happy life, uh, which I think I've achieved finally. I'm also one of the lucky ones in that I have I've had access to resources. You know, I could find therapy. Um, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a very metropolitan area with a lot of resources. Now, I couldn't find anybody who treats BDD, but at least there were doctors I could see. Um, and in fact, to this day, I'm one of maybe two or three people in the whole Bay Area uh, that treats BDD. Um, I've also been very fortunate to make some very good friends uh, with other people who have BDD. One of them's right there, Chris. Um, he's been very, very helpful to me. And my long association, association with the International OCD Foundation has been very, very beneficial to me. It's really, I think of it as very much a community, and a community of people who really understand. You know, much, they have an annual conference, much like you do here, and being there is a powerful experience to be with other people who have experienced uh, the same thing. Okay, so what does the Tower Bridge have anything to do with this talk? Um, so, yes, I still have BDD. So, I, this was, I think, Wednesday, where it was windy and rainy. I guess I could be any day here, right? Um, anyway, it's, so, I was walking around uh, the Tower, um, at, or Tower Bridge, and uh, I noticed that people were walking across it. And I thought, well, that'd be kind of a cool thing to see the bridge up, up close like that. And then as I got closer, I could see people's hair were blowing around. It was pretty windy up there. And for a minute I thought to myself, huh, do I really want to do this? If I get up there, it's gonna blow my hair around. And I thought to myself, Oh, what the hell, I'm in London, how can I not do this? Don't let the BDD interfere. And so I walked across that bridge, and my hair blew all over the place. I didn't really care. I couldn't, I couldn't have done that 10 years ago. Um, I would have come all the way to London and not walked over that bridge, um, because it would have triggered too many strong feelings for me. And I will say that that's the problem with BDD, is how we feel. And it's dealing with, so the, the problem isn't so much how we look, of course, it's how we feel. And the emotions are what need to be dealt with, really, as well as the, as well as the cognitions. I'm getting a little sidetracked here. Um, oh, I'm gonna leave you with a, with a quote that is attributed to Winston Churchill, but I've also read that it's not attributed to him. But since I'm in London, I figure I'd give him credit. <laughs> It goes, when you're 20, you care what everyone thinks. When you're 40, you stop caring what everyone thinks. When you're 60, you realize no one was ever thinking about you in the first place. And I think that's very true when it comes to BDD. You know, most of us are very concerned about what other people might think. But you know, in truth, they're not thinking much of anything. It's all coming from inside. And that's an important concept for us to remember, is that yeah, you know, most people with BDD, you know, don't can't don't have many memories of people saying really bad things about their appearance. Yes, maybe once or twice, and that could help set the stage for it. But for by and by and large, you know, we're not going to have people say bad things to us. And so, whatever it is we're thinking is in fact just coming from our own thoughts. Um, so, um, so. I think that's an important takeaway. People aren't really thinking what, the, what we think they might be thinking. Um, all right, so here's my shameless plug, uh, the book I wrote a few years ago. Uh, I just wanted to mention something about the um, cover. I was mortified when I saw the cover. I had no input into it. Uh, the editor just put this together. And I first saw it, and it was this zombie-like creature. And I immediately contacted uh, the editor, and I said, we got to do something. Can't you change this? And she said, no, 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 the book's already printed. That's it. 
And then what, what, it, what occurred to me as I look at this, what I see is tremendous torment and shame. Now the editor knew nothing about BDD before reading my book. And this is what she came up with, which I thought was really remarkable. So I'm still not wild about the cover, but I, it, does make a, it does make a lot of sense. Um, I just didn't want another book with a cover that had a mirror on it. I told her, whatever you do, I don't want a mirror on the cover. Um, so this is what I got. Um, all right, um, I know that these slides will be available, uh, I'll talk will be available online, so you'll have this, but I'm always pleased to, uh, happy to respond to questions that people might have. If you didn't have a chance to, you know, maybe ask something today. Uh, most of us who specialize in BDD, you know, do get contacted from people literally all over the world because there are so few of us who really do specialize uh, in this problem. So if you'd like to reach out, uh, please, please feel free to do so. And lastly, thank you. Uh, it's been quite a pleasure to be here this week, and this conference is just amazing. And so I really thank you for being here today. Um, it's just been a wonderful, a wonderful day. I know we have a few hours left still today. Um, so I know we got to finish, but again, thank you all very much for coming.